Welcome everyone to Stay Tuned. My name is Ray Hotoda and I'm the music director and conductor of the Fresno Philharmonic. And today we are so thrilled to have composer William Bolcom with us, Grammy Award winning, Pulitzer Prize winning, uh, fabulous composer. And uh, thank you, William Bolcom, for being with us today. My pleasure. So we want to talk about the piece we uh, just recorded uh, for our virtual masterworks, our first one, which was um, just broadcast in January. And everyone is welcome to take a look at the video. It's for free. And we performed your piece, Comedia, for almost 18th century orchestra. And I have to say, this is the first time I've conducted your work, uh, an mm -hmm. orchestral work. But the first time I was introduced to your music was the beautiful, uh, graceful ghost uh, rag um, at USC when I was getting my doctorate in piano performance and, and someone was performing that piece on their recital and I was just stunned that it was written by a living composer and so tell us tell us a little bit about your background with American song about rag uh, ragtime music that was so influential and in, and I would love to hear a story about um, the uh, famous famous African-American composer and um, U.B. Blake. Oh, uh, he, was so he was something marvelous. Uh, the whole thing about rag is something that I just stumbled into by pure chance, it turned out. Uh, I was writing uh, operas for actors, uh, which is to say instead of opera singers, and I did that twice, actually, once for um, Actor Studio Theater in, in uh, 19... 63, my God, dear, so back that time. And uh, it was quite a little thing. Dynamite Tonight, a little small orchestra, but starring people very well known in the theater, such as Alvin Epstein and, and uh, oh, whole, you know, very well known theater people who are William Redfield, who, had, uh, and, uh, who actually was very musically trained, and George Gaines, otherwise known as uh, Longyens. And actually, he had been. Uh, he had played Jupiter in a show by Cole Porter called uh, Out of This World, and uh, that was George, and he was also in the... So this was a, a play for actors who had some kind of a singing ability. It didn't sound like singers so much, but the one thing about it is that they, they did take care of something I cared so much about was words, and they all cared a lot about the words. And one of the things that probably has made it such a joy when... when uh, fate brought Joan to me was that here's a singer who has a voice I love but understands and cares about the words you're singing and not very many singers were trained to do that. There are a lot of people who, I mean, I would do some vo vocal repertoire, repertoire works with various people and I remember one particular one, she's Greek American, had beautiful, voluptuous voice and a very, quite a figure and she quite, you know, we all thought she'd be a very big hit. Anyway, so I was working as a, you know, a company that's working with her and, uh, I said, well, well it, was a, it was a Brahms lead. And I said, this is, you know, not every song by Brahms has got wonderful text. Some of them, it's like you played a Hallmark reading card. But but this is a particularly loved one. I forget who it was, it was Goethe or whatever. And I said, I said, don't you think it's a lovely text, Athena? She said, uh-uh. And I said, don't you know what it means? She said, no. I said, don't you think it matters? She said, no. She had just sung it all the phonetic way. Vowels, consonants, and all the rest of it. To them, it was just, well, like playing, I, I, I don't know, it, it could have been Eskimo, you know, it wouldn't matter to it. You know, that was, and that's, of course, drives me up. But now, I think that's changed quite a bit now. I think singers are now really trying at least to act a little bit, and maybe they're starting to get a little bit better about being understand the English word. I mean, it was just, uh, Joan, of course, was a bane of so many singers, and was, you know, the, the despair of, Many people, because you could always understand every word she sang. And that was also true with people like Albert Epstein. And just the other day, I was uh, hearing something that was uh, somebody I didn't know, but also was very, very close, uh, very clear. So things have changed in the 40, 50, 60 years since all that happened. And um, I would love to share with the audiences that Facebook, I, I just watched on um, the Carytown. Um, Concert concerts on, yeah, concerts on Facebook where you and Joan are singing these, I mean, so many songs and you have them all from memory, which I find so amazing. Well, um, yeah. From Cole Porter to, um, you know, uh, Sondheim to, it's just so wonderful to see you working together mm -hmm. uh, in these, in the context. Like 
chocolate candy and just like honey from the bee. Oh, I'm just wild about Harry and he's just wild about cannot do without. He's just wild about me. What I really uh, find so fascinating about your music um, is the eclecticism that you uh, put into it, especially in this comedia that we just performed. Uh -huh. uh, can you tell us a little bit about your pro creative process in writing that piece? Well, uh, in the end of the 1960s, it was pre pretty clear to some of us that the what I would have to call peer pressure total chromatic style wasn't getting us very far because it really wasn't based on anything else but but, but scaring each other into putting kind of a reasonable kind of wash of uh, same level of dissonance all the way through, which was deadly to, to have to listen to and so on. But uh, some of us were beginning to rebel a little bit. And I was beginning to rebel in the sense of uh, wanting to uh, start using tonality again if I wanted to and not have to be required to be atonal all the time. And, and what I'm interested in, of course, is I like to go to the outer reaches of tonality where it does sound almost atonal, but some way it's still related. It's like the solar system. If you're if you're a kind of sort of a spaceship, when you're close to the sun, you know, uh, it'll be uh, very strongly with the sun and the blood if you're in the outer planets like that one just got uh, D turn into a no longer a planet called Pluto, but that means that'll be the same thing, but it'll be so far away. You're still somehow connected to the sun, but you don't maybe see it anymore. But the fact is without that sun, it wouldn't be part of this system. So in the way I saw what I look at it. So, I mean, uh, a lot of my music goes out to the outer reaches. I mean, out to Uranus or <laughs> so on, but, but uh, a lot of it goes to the same level as earth, I guess. So, uh, Doing the kind of spaceship ability to go from different intensities of t tonality has given me a sort of a kind of a freedom. And I think Comedian was about like the first one that started doing this. And uh, it was at that point, I really wanted to have some fun. Uh, the uh, new St. Paul Chamber Orchestra had just been formed out of the leftovers of the Minneapolis Symphony and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra is when they merged. And so it ended up with kind of a strange kind of one flute, two clarinet. Oh, yeah, really. You know, it's very, very strong. It, it was whatever was left over. Uh, the two horns, uh, no percussion at first. Uh, and uh, so uh, Dennis Russell Davies, who's an old friend and uh, worked with me and had done most of my major premieres. He premiered my songs of innocence. He experienced all my operas for Lyric or Opera of Chicago and a hell of a lot else. I mean, he's somebody, one of a very close friend. We'd known him for many, many years. And uh, so it was a question right then of uh, starting this new uh, opera, you know, this new uh, orchestra. And so when I looked at it, I said, well, it's got everything about 18th century, except for the fact that very few symphonies toward the end of the 18th century used clarinets at all. You know, most of the time it was an opera, but you're seeing more and more. And I, of course, and Mozart, you know, the later symphonies all have clarinets. But there was a while in the day they thought it was a little low class because clarinet was always somehow associated with opera, which was something else. But... Uh, Bit by bit, everybody somehow brought it in. Generally, when the level of the proficiency was such that you could, when these hornists, you know, kind of just, you know, they didn't just go out and go hunt for deer. They would actually play and play and become good musicians. And uh, the history of that is quite something. So it was fun to see how it all, so I said, okay, this is this, this part. Of it. So that's something kind of a funny, there's an 18th century atmosphere about it a little bit, the whole piece. Well, and I yeah, and I love how you give the clarinet um, so, so much prominence, especially the E-flat clarinet solos in that. Oh, E-flat clarinet. I'm, uh, I'm addicted to E-flat clarinet. I don't know what it is. There's something about it. It's, 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 it's kind of a <clears throat> irreverent kookiness that just absolutely delights me. <laughs> Well, I have been very lucky in my conductors, Dennis, Leonard Slatkin, uh, and a whole host of other people, Carl St. Clair, who have really understood what I was doing. And, you know, I've had a very good way that way. I think I've been very lucky. Uh, well, and, and going back to your rags, I just discovered your piece, Ragomania, 
which I, I would love to program uh, sometime very, very soon once we're you know open and able to have that many instruments on stage. But oh, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about that and your influence, again, with rags, this wonderful American kind of iconic style, this genre. Well, I think maybe I could say that rags is what pulled me out of the uh, peer pressure total chromatic, uh, which I was talking about then, you know, the way how you sort of wrote music to somebody to defend yourselves from the other guys writing that kind of music. And somehow, I'm not sure anybody really wanted to hear it. It was just you know, somehow, well, sometimes it was wonderful. I mean, there are, there are great people who can write very lovely, well, Donald Martino's ability to write uh, 12 tone, very strict in such a beautiful way that it sounded so gorgeous. And then look at, look at, uh, look at Alban Berg. I mean, the Wozzeck is all serial, but it doesn't feel like uh, mechanical, you know? That's because he had a very good total ear. So did course did, so did Donald. Uh, so I guess what got interesting to me was all of a sudden I had a kind of odd feeling. I, well, listen, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, this is quite a story. I, I, this will take much more time than you'll have, probably. But that's uh, okay. Please share. Maybe you can cut it in pieces. We're out. In fact, I think I'm going to be asked to do something about it. As a matter of fact, as we're talking, I just have been uh, heir to watching Marc Andre Amelin, and uh, he is doing all of my piano rags for Hyperion. And this is a big, wonderful recording. They're doing it right now in Wooster and Mechanics Hall, which has uh, got terrific acoustics, famous for that. My wife, Joan Morris, and I have played it twice, I believe. And it's a, it's a gorgeous place. And uh, they were there, and I, uh, they were there Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, pretty much all day, uh, recording 17 or about maybe, maybe there might be about 30 rags altogether. They will bring out in a big box of kind of, 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 of all my piano rags. And uh, this is really wonderful to see happening. Uh, I'm going to want to see if I can talk the publisher into uh, putting a kind of a definitive critical edition so that you know and see if we can put them the two things out in tandem so that just right now funny you should ask about the uh, ragtime um well the history very simply i'm see what we can pull out of it because i just wrote this for them a little bit um a very lovely man i got to know named norman lloyd who was a composer more or less in the william schumann tradition named norman lloyd he was the person who was given the job to distribute funds for uh, the Fountain Ford Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts for composers and, and other artworks and so on, and also orchestras. And we'd have lunch quite often because it, it was just good company. I enjoyed talking to him. And uh, anyway, so here we were having a, a lunch one day, and he says, do you know the name Scott Joplin? I said, oh, I've seen this someplace, but I don't know much about it. 1967 now. And uh, well, he well he said. Uh, Norman says he, he wrote the Maple Leaf Rag. Oh, I said, oh my! He also wrote a whole bunch of piano rags and an opera called Tremonitia. The only trouble with the Tremonitia is that we can find a score. There's a card for it in the Library of Congress, and we have no score. And I said, you know what? This is actually going to get my sleuthing bug going. So I started to try to find out some kind of about it. So I went to well, like I said, a library, for example, no sign of it. And I went over to the Museum of City of New York. I went to the County Cologne Library up in Harlem, uh, and uh, wherever else I might possibly find it. Most normal, I, I called my friends at the Library of Congress. If they'd known about it, and they all said the same thing: if you ever find it, let us know. So here I am teaching at Queens College. I am teaching a. Uh, a theory course, but also one of those great big gut courses with five other people, you know, music depreciation, as Virgil Thompson used to call it. And uh, and here is a Rudy Blesch, who would come in and teach a course in jazz. Well, there were 10 names on our door. I had a drawer of myself. And just for the time I came in and came out, I mean, people talked about how it a warm, uh, cozy, and you know, uh, friendly collegial atmosphere. We hardly saw anybody else except just going in, doing your thing, getting out of there. And so... Well, but here's Rudy Place. He's teaching. The, and I've tried now for a month and a half to try to get a hold of Cremonis or something. And I thought, well, I'll ask him. He's a jazz guy. Uh, and Mr. Blesch, do you think you could help me? I've been trying to find a score for Cremonis by Scott Joplin. He says, I have one at home. Shall I bring it? Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I, I nearly dropped my teeth. And I have Isn't that amazing? So he brought it. He brought it home. Uh, I brought it to home and played it. And I said, this is amazing. He also said, you know, he wrote all these nice piano regs. He put me in contact with a wonderful guy, still alive, named Max Morath. 
M O R I T H. He was the man who put together a little someplace in the early '60s uh, uh, a series. I think it was called "This Is Ragtime" on TV because he went into the history of Scott Joplin and the people who were the classic rag, but, uh, James Scott and uh, Joseph Lamb and and a whole slew of other people. And he put together a little uh, hundred rags book kind of private publishing and uh, Rudy got me a copy of it and we became friends have been all these many years with Max and uh, Joan and I and Max have actually recorded together and so on but anyway here we are so I'm back here and I'm trying all these things out and uh, all of a sudden over a certain amount of time I began to say gee this is really lovely stuff I, I you know what's nice is I feel instead of having to do uh, well first of all I had all the predictable things that uh, anything that was built on March the March armature, which is, of course, rags are like a march in the way that it's formed, you know, two, two strains in a trio and, and four, four, and, the, and, and you know when the cadence comes because that's where the foot goes. And uh, all of that together, but somehow that was such a relief. And I started writing on those things. I even started, first of all, I sort of, the first of the rags, which will be the first on the CD, sounds like somebody from, uh, still sort of got one finger with Igor Stravinsky in there. But uh, uh, <laughs> but then over time, I began to really go, let's, let's go for the whole thing. Let's go for a true classic rag and true classic harmonies and see where that takes me. So uh, a couple of dozen, three, two, three dozen uh, rags later, uh, that's what that's where I went, and it 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 was something that I found was wonderfully liberating. I mean, well, I can write tonal music still, why not? And I can also write tonal music as part of a piece, and not something else that isn't tonal, and find some kind of ways they could be. In other words, it opened up the possibilities for me to uh, get rid of that sense of having to be uh, always that. When I say peer pressure, academic, uh, atonal, uh, which was mostly written, I think, I hate to say that, but I don't think a lot of my composer friends would like it, but there's an atmosphere of fear in a lot of that. Yeah. So I'm glad to be out of that fear, fearfulness. And of course, I got kicked for it, but that's okay. One just, you know, one survives. Yes. Well, now that we're talking about, you know, maybe future composers and, and artists right now, especially uh, in this pandemic, what are some, advice or hopeful things that you might be able to share with them? Um, anything that you want to impart from sure. your experience? Yeah. <clears throat> well, for starts, I feel that they're very lucky compared to where I was. I didn't have to fight this kind of academic uh, conformism. Uh, everybody I know who writes today writes pretty much what he or she wants to write. And uh, it, 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 so there's a very wide panoply of possible musics that are coming out all the place, which is great. I just want people to do what they really, if you don't want to do it i don't want to hear it <laughs> and i think that a lot of people felt that way that they, they probably didn't realize that they were not doing something they really wanted to do uh, and they were doing something they didn't want so it was something to pull out from underneath i mean i i you know i did catch hell for it that's fine maybe that was a good proof that maybe i was on the right track thank you all so much for watching our stay tuned episode with william Bolcom. you can watch the comedia for almost 18th century orchestra on our first masterwork series, which is available on our YouTube page and also our website. Thank you so much, Mr. Balkan, for joining us today for Stay Tuned. My pleasure.